Hey guys, welcome to Victory Church Online. Wherever you are at, I'm so glad that you're joining to just take in what God has to say to you today. So get ready to take some notes, get those Bibles out or the Bible apps. Hope you enjoy today's message. Hey, it's New Year's Eve. I think we've had a pretty good year in 2023. Have you seen some miracles? Have you seen God do some things in your life and in your family? What expectation do you have for 2024? Now listen, it's important when you're going somewhere new to know where you came from. And so today what we're going to give you is what we call instant replay. We're taking the top six messages with content that we want to carry forward into 2024. So we're going to give you a little bit of a rehash of what those are on video. And then we're going to have a WWE Smackdown tag team preach today between myself, our founding pastor, Pastor Mike Ware, and our campus launch pastor and our youth pastor. Come on, somebody. Matt McAfee. So listen, are you ready? I want you to strap in today. I want you to get ready because there are some things that if we carry from 2023 into 2024 and some things we make sure we leave in 2023, 24 is going to be the best one you ever had. Are you ready for this? Come on, guys. Let's go. There is a power available from God that if you can learn how to tap into it, it will change everything about your life, your finances, your family, your future. But the problem is, you've got a loose connection. You know what that loose connection is? If you want to move the hand that moves the world, you know how to fix that loose connection? It's by prayer. Prayer is what fixes the loose connection in your life. It stirs up God. It stirs up some Holy Ghost activity. Come on, Holy Spirit, come on into this house. It stirs up miracles. It stirs up breakthroughs. It stirs up deliverance. It stirs up salvation. It stirs up all these kind of things. Freedom. It stirs up all those kind of things. Wealth and health and all that good stuff. That's what it does. When are you going to start crawling on your knees and saying, God, I need you? When are you going to start going to crawl through the obstacles and the crowds and the distractions and say, Lord, I'm straining. I'm reaching out because I'm going to touch the hem of your garment because I'm praying. I'm seeking the hand that moves the world in my life. When you pray, a suddenly can happen. Some of you need a suddenly in your life. When you pray, I'm telling the Spirit of God is saying, come on, we're going to go there. We're going we're to move right now. You don't have a clue what happens when you pray. Amen and amen. Wow, I looked a lot thinner back then. I think I had too many Christmas cookies. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, I'm so excited about our tag team right now. Come on, instant replay. Pastor Matt is going to give us his best impression of, of slow motion. Amen. Listen, I get, I get to kick this off by talking about something that we started last year, actually earlier this year, on moving the hand that moves the world. How many of you would like to move the hand that moves the world? I'm talking about the hand of God, the hand of God that can split oceans. I'm talking about turn the sun back in the sky. I'm talking about a God that can raise up the dead. You want to move a hand like that? How many of you want to move a hand like that? I'm talking about the, the hand of God that can form man and breathe life into him. I'm talking about the hand of God that knows how to do things, that knows the number of hair on your head. How many of you want to move the hand that moves the world? I'm going to tell you, there's one way to move the hand of God. One way to move the hand that moves the world is one thing that I taught you at the beginning of this year. It's by prayer. You've got to pray. I said, you've got to pray. I said, you have to pray. You have to pray. Look, this is instant replay. We're going backwards just a few months right now because we need to remind you, I think, of the most important messages that we brought to you in 2023 because that's how we're launching 2024. And we have to begin it with prayer. Prayer, prayer, the hand of God. I mean, I'm going to tell you, when you pray, when you pray, something happens. Heavens begin to shake. Angels come to attention. I'm telling you, when you pray, I'm telling you, there's something goes on in the spiritual world that you and I cannot see. Most of us don't pray except when you have a need. You don't pray unless there's something that you're panicked about or fearful of. But God wants you to come to him every day, every day, every day, and just talk to him. And that you can tell him that you love him, that you appreciate him, 
that you thank him for all the things he's done in your life, that's called prayer. Prayer. Come on, how many of you want to move the hand that moves the world? One thing that you've got to know, this one point I want to give you this morning is that prayer changes everything. It's why we should pray. It's why we should call out to God. It's why we should spend time with God. All I know is when I pray, I I sense that the gates of hell are shaking. I, I sense demons are trembling, knowing that my voice is being raised up into the heavenlies to a God whose hand can touch you, whose hand can change the world. That's what prayer does. That's what your prayer does. It makes a difference. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Let me just give you an example. Abraham. Everybody know who Abraham is? His nephew and family were living in Sodom and Gomorrah, an evil, wicked place. And God said to Abraham, he says, I'm going to destroy that whole place. And, and Abraham, he, listen, he didn't just think that was okay. He didn't think that was all right. He didn't accept it. He didn't write it off. He didn't say, well, too bad for them. Bad luck. They shouldn't be living there. You know what Abraham did? Abraham prayed. He reached out to a God whose hand can move the world. You really want to see the world, your world move? Listen, you got to pray. And Abraham said, would you destroy this place if there were 50 righteous? God said, no. He said, what? How about 45? And God said, no, I will not destroy it if there are 45 righteous people in that place. He said, what about 30 or 20 or 10 righteous people? Would you destroy it? And God said, for 10 righteous people, I would not destroy that city. Now, Abraham knew that Lot and his family were eight souls. Let me tell you what prayer does. Before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent angels to Lot and his family and rescued them out of that place because of one thing. One man moved the hand that moved the world. His name was Abraham, and he did it by prayer because prayer makes a difference. Come on, everybody say prayer Prayer. makes a difference. difference. Think about Elijah, the prophet, who... The whole, all of Israel had turned away from God, were worshiping Baal and, and, and Elijah. I mean, the worst time of Israel. And Elijah called all the prophets of Baal and said, we're going to have a contest. Prepare your altar. I'll prepare mine and cover it in water. And let's pray to our God. You can pray to your God. I'm going to pray to my God. And whoever has fire come down from heaven and, and laps this up will know whose God it is. All day long, those prophets of Baal called out to their God, cutting themselves and everything else, and nothing happened. They wore themselves out. But one man, one man knew that prayer made a difference, and he called out to God with a simple prayer, and suddenly fire flashed out of heaven and licked up that altar, and a whole nation turned to God because of one thing, prayer, prayer. I said prayer. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world. You want to move the world? I said you want to move the world? You want to move your world? You got to pray. You've got to pray. Prayer makes a difference. And I'm challenging you right now to make a difference in 2024. Let's start off this year with prayer because prayer changes things. It makes a difference in your family, in your finances, in your future, and with your friends. Come on, let's don't talk about it. Let's do it. I said, let's do it. Everybody say, prayer Prayer. makes a difference. But that's not enough. You know what else you need to have? You better have some faith. Take a look at this. What kind of faith fuels the hand of God to move in a room that I'm in? I want to know because I want that kind of faith. I want to walk in that type of faith. And the Lord told me that if I would begin to fixate my faith and see something in my spirit and place my expectation on it, come on somebody, then in that moment, God can begin to move and act upon his word in a way like he never has before. Sometimes we so fixate on our problems and we so look at the things and the obstacles in our lives 
life that all we keep doing is running into the same thing over and over and over again. But what would happen if we so fixated our eyes on Jesus that we got past the problem? Because let me, let me clue you into something. God's not moved by your problems. As a matter of fact, I hate to say it, he could care less about the problem because it's nothing to him. But what God is moved by is faith. Jesus is standing in the road calling your name right now. It says that Bartimaeus instantly, immediately gained his sight and he began following Jesus on the road. And this morning, Jesus is standing in the road for you. And he's saying, can you see yourself healed? Can you see yourself delivered? Can you see yourself not addicted anymore? Can you see yourself free? Can you see your children walking with the Lord? Can you see revival in your church? Can you see awakening of the lost? Can you see your community coming back to Jesus? That's all in the way. It's all in the road right there with Jesus. But first he's going to ask you a question before you actually get what you want. What have you seen? Come on, what have you seen? What's in your spirit? You know, Bartimaeus is one of my favorite people in the entire Bible. You know why? Because Bartimaeus got a picture of what could be in his spirit and saw it manifest in his life. You know why? Because Bartimaeus, the Bible says that he sat in a customary position on the side of the road with a cup asking people to meet an ongoing need with a momentary solution every day. And people got tuned out to his cries. People got used to him being in the same spot every day asking for the same thing. And see, but here's the thing that was going on on the inside of Bartimaeus. Because as he sat there with his cup, he sat on that corner. And as he, as he heard the stories of Jesus healing people, he began to say to himself, well, if, I, if he healed another blind man, he could heal me. If, if he healed a leper, surely he could heal me. If, if, if he raised a little girl from the dead, then surely he could do it for me. And every day, the anticipation in his spirit of seeing himself healed made him say, if I could ever just get within earshot of Jesus, I'm going to be as relentless as I have to to get him to stop. Because if I could just show him that I believe that he is who he says he is, that I can walk in what he said I could walk in. I'm going to get healed because I see it in my spirit first. So when Jesus comes through town, Jericho was a throughway city. That's how he got to hear all the stories. It was a gateway city to every major city around. And, and right in that moment, I have to ask you this question. How are we going to carry a fixated faith? A faith that says, I'm going to fixate on what God promised me. And I'm not going to take my eyes off it no matter what circumstances dictate. How do we carry that kind of fixated faith that says, I will see the promises of God manifest in my life now. How do we see that in 2024? I'll give you this answer. Jesus said this. He said that we should ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. So what does that mean? I'm going to ask, but see, he promised me that he would do beyond what I could ask, think, or imagine. So why would I keep asking if he could do beyond that? I'm not going to ask him for what I want. I'm going to ask him to show me what he wants. And then I'm going to keep on knocking on the gates of heaven until I get my answer. And how do I knock on the gates of heaven? Prayer. And I'm going to continue to do what? Pray and remind of his word. It says in the book of Psalms, God, I put you in remembrance of your word. What does that mean? That if you would speak his word back to him full of faith, guess what? The manifestation of that word begins to happen. And see, I'm going to change my customary position this year. We got to get out of what's become ordinary. 
where the expectation stays the same as it was before. But I'm going to move into a place of expectation where as I begin to pray and seek God, the level of faith and expectation I have for it, I become pregnant with anticipation for its arrival. And I'm going to continue to prepare. I'm going to continue to knock on that thing. And see, here's the other thing. Even though I'm knocking on the gates of heaven, I'm also not scared to rattle the gates of hell over it either. Because every opposition that comes against me that says my family can't be saved, that says I can't break that addiction, that says I can never be healed, I'm going to rebuke that with what? The name of Jesus and cover my family with the blood of Jesus with the expectation that what? There's going to come a moment. There's going to come a time when that kid is going to come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus that I'm going to see my healing manifest. Why? Because my healing is not dependent upon the way I feel or what I can see or what a doctor said to me. My healing is completely dependent upon this. I've seen it in my spirit and I'm not willing to let go of it. And I'll get as loud as I have to. I'll knock as long as I have to. Come on, somebody. I'll go after God until I can pull the promises of God down from heavenly places. That's fixated faith. Are you ready to go into 2024? Because you're going to have to change your customary position. You're going to have to change what's customary because you know the definition of insanity, don't you? Doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and expecting a different result. This year, change the customary position and get accustomed to the things of God exploding in your life. Come on, somebody. You know, the next thing that we really have to be able to do is be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can't do this without the Holy Ghost. Why don't you take a look at this? Jesus did not shed his blood for something as common as religion. Jesus shed his blood so that we could have life. We could have the eternal, everlasting, abundant life. You can go to a new level in your relationship with God. You can go to a new level experiencing his love. You can be go to a new level being yielded to his power. You can be more surrendered and more full of him than you ever hoped or dreamed possible. Because God wants to fill you. Yes, you. Yes, the one that's messy. Yes, the one that's broken. Yes, the one that you, you've tried out running his grace. He wants to fill you with every fiber of your heart, every nook and cranny of your person with his presence and power. He wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Everyone shout, we need the Holy Spirit. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus this morning. Everyone shout, we need the Holy Spirit. Let's do it again. Say, we need the Holy Spirit. We need his presence. We need his power. We need all of his fruit. We need all of his gifts. Our lives will not be complete without him. And as we were sitting, and as I was worshiping this morning, I heard the Lord say that there's some people in this room that he does not want you to start 2024 without receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Everyone shout, we need the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you first believed? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you first believed? The Apostle Paul was walking through a church in Ephesus. He comes across a group of disciples. And he says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you first believed? And they respond the way that many of you would respond. They say, we had not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And Paul, and Paul fixed that up real quick. He laid his hands on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. The, the same God who baptized back then still baptizes today, and Jesus wants to baptize you with his Holy Spirit. Everyone shout, we need the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is an experience available to every born-again believer where Jesus immersed them into the life, the presence, and the power of God. It's for every, everyone shout, every. It's for every believer in Jesus Christ. See, the same spirit that baptized 120 in the upper room in Acts chapter 2 is the same spirit who filled the multitudes in Samaria in Acts chapter 8. The same spirit who baptized the multitudes in Samaria in Acts chapter 8 is the same one who baptized the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. The same spirit who baptized the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 is the same spirit who came upon the Gentiles in Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10. And the same spirit that came upon the, the Gentiles in Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10 is the same one that baptized 
baptized the church in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. And the same God who did it back then wants to do it today. He has not changed one bit. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's the healer. He's the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. Everyone shout, we need the Holy Spirit. The question you might be asking now is, how do I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? If you're taking notes, everyone lean in. It's super profound, super deep. All you have to do is ask. Ask. Jesus says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? Not to those who earn it. Not to those who deserve it. Not to those who give enough money. He says, you know, I give it to those who ask. If you could earn it and you deserve it, it would no longer be a gift but a reward. He wants to fill you. Yes, the one that's messy. Yes, the one that's broken. Yes, the one that you, you may have gone to the club last night, but you come up here today with a genuine heart of repentance and you believe in the Lord Jesus. He wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons he wants to fill the Holy Spirit because he wants you to be able to hear his voice. Check out this video. Let me tell you this. If your prayers have hit the ceiling, they've gone too far. God is not up there. Know you not, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is where? Within you. The Holy Spirit of God, the one that was hovering over the face of the waters, the one that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, the one that baptized the early church in Holy Ghost power, the one that still saves, he, was, he lives not up there, but inside or here. You're not helpless, you're not alone, you're not a victim. You have victory because why? The King of Kings lives on the inside of you. And he wants to speak to you. You might be in a stark situation right now. You may not feel like you got things going on. You may not know your left from your right. But when God speaks, everything can change. I firmly believe with every fiber of my being that we don't serve a God who is distant. Come on, somebody. We don't serve a God who wants to be left alone. We don't serve a God who is content to sitting in the thrones of heaven. No, he would become incarnate, come down in human flesh and blood, not just to heal us from a distance, but to actually touch our wounds. We serve a God who is personal. We serve a God who is relational. We serve a God who still speaks. And I hear his voice today say, come unto me, all those who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God still speaks, and he wants to speak to you. Everyone shout, God still speaks, and he wants to speak to me it is the innate ability and the divine privilege of every child of God to hear their father's voice. And I know sometimes we, we hear about people who hear the voice of God and we think it's something spooky and we think it's something just absolutely supernatural out of this world. But And we wonder, can God really speak to me? Does God really want to speak to me? I know that God speaks to Pastor Mike and Pastor Jonathan, but of course they're like pastors. But you know what? God does speak to Pastor Mike and Pastor Jonathan. He doesn't speak to them because they're super Christians. He speaks to them because they're sons. Come on, somebody. God wants to speak to you not because of what you've done to deserve it. Oh, I want to talk about the blood just for a second. Because when you couldn't earn it and when you couldn't deserve it and when you were stuck in the sin and stuck in the mess of your own making, Jesus Christ did what you could not. He shed a blood that was so precious, the most precious commodity of heaven, so that you could have things that you didn't ask, deserve, or even imagine. And one of those things is reconciling a reconciliation, a relationship with our God in heaven. And God wants to speak to you. God wants to come into your, to your prayer closet. He wants you, when he reads your word, he wants to make the words jump off the page and speak to you. When you're going to the grocery store, he wants to lead you by the Spirit of God. When you're going on your everyday life, he wants to pull you aside to a quiet place so he can make room to hear your Father's voice. And there's three simple things I'm going to encourage you today if you're taking notes. How do you hear the voice of God. How many people know that in 2024, there are some things that are going to happen that we don't even know about yet? In 2024, you're going to face some situations, some challenges that right now you don't even foresee coming. There's some people right now you're asking for a breakthrough. You're wondering, how can I hear the voice of God? Because if you can hear the voice of God, you will always have victory. Come on, somebody. I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care what the banker said. I don't care what your sister said. Whose report shall we believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. And as long as I hear God's voice and obey, I can always have victory. 
So three ways that you can hear God's voice in 2024. Number one is hide God's word in your heart. The, the psalmist David said, thy word I have hid in my heart that might not sin against thee. God's voice sounds like his word and his word sounds like his voice. Trying to hear God's voice without reading your Bible is trying to receive a phone call and your cell phone shut off. You, it can't happen. God's voice sounds like his word. His word sounds like his voice. The next thing is to follow the leading. When you, in prayer, throughout your day, you get these ideas, these, these impressions. Don't discard them. They're not just simply bad Taco Bell from the night before. God is trying to speak to you. When you're in prayer and someone's name pops in your head, text them, call them, reach out to them, encourage them. God is trying to use you to encourage someone else. And lastly, make remember, shout, make room. Everyone shout, make room. make room. Who can you kick out of your schedule this week? Who can, who, what can you kick out of your schedule next year to make room for your father's voice so you can hear, listen, obey, and have victory? And one of the reasons you got to hear his voice because the enemy has a voice, and he's going to try to come at you with temptation. And you got to know how to apply what I call the sniff test of discernment so you can know the voice of the shepherd from the voice of the stranger. Check out this video. Whatever we allow through the gates of our eyes, through the gates of our ears and into our lives, we give the authority to take up residency and to now have authority in our lives because why? We invite it in. You know, your Bible says that, that a foolish man feasts on trash, but the wise man desires wisdom. Do you know that your adversary has one weapon? deception. If he can get you to believe the lie, he can do anything else he wants in your life. But first, you have to bite the bait. I don't need to be pacified. I need someone to look me in my eye and say, get better, come up higher. There's always an upward call in Christ Jesus. And the minute you put your trust in something other than God, guess what happens? You cease to focus on the things of God. And when the things of God stop becoming your priority, the gates open wide. We got to take out the trash. We got to take out the trash. You know, I, I, I refuse to take the trash of 2023, 2022, 2021, 1971. I'm not taking any of it into 24. You know why? Because I don't have space for that in what God's called me to do in this new year. I don't have space for that in what God's saying he wants to do in my family this coming year, what he wants to do in Victory Church this coming year. You know, we took a whole month and we talked about setting up boundaries and gates that, that weren't flexible or determined by circumstances, but we said that they were founded on what? The principles of God which do not change right? Is that where we started? But there comes a certain point where we understand that, that what we allow, if we don't keep evaluating what's in the refrigerator, what's leftovers that might have started out as okay are no longer okay. They get moldy. They make you sick. They bring things into your life that you don't want to be there. And, and if you remember back to this message, if you were here, we had a nice big refrigerator up here and we had a whole lot of Tupperware. And we kind of gave it the, the sniff test, right? Because there comes a certain point where, you know, there are certain things that happen to you during a year where, you know what, sometimes what, what you're feeling is reasonable. God gave you emotions and feelings for a reason. It's true. You know, so many times we as Christians, we're like, well, we shouldn't feel that. We shouldn't feel angry. We shouldn't feel fear. We, we, we shouldn't feel, uh, you know, confused or upset or, or worried or, or grief or any of those things. That's hogwash. God made that for you. 
Because why? It is a mechanism for your healing and your protection. But there comes a certain point where grief, if you leave it in the refrigerator long enough, because see, there's an expiration date on grief. And what you might have lost, which, who you might have lost, or what you might have lost. There's a season of grief that brings about healing in your soul. But the moment that you let it stay in the refrigerator too long, hang on to the grief too long, it instantly becomes depression, anxiety, despair. And suddenly you go from the moment of grief and healing to the moment that you start to realize, I can't get out of bed in the morning anymore. You know why? Because your grief reached its expiration date and it's time to throw out the leftovers. You know, there, there are so many situations that we can look at where we've experienced trauma or injustice, but it be, can become victimization if we allow it to. It, we can face rejection, and all of a sudden it turns into our resentment and our bitterness. Our past hurts turn into torment, mental anguish, and anger. Our lies and words from others suddenly turn into our insecurities, our self-hatred, and our doubt. Fear turns into anxiety, worry, and dread. The stresses of life, and I just need to relax, turn into alcohol, drug use. But we don't need those things. You know what we need? We need the Holy Ghost. We need to... Let the Holy Ghost speak to us and show us the things that, you know, 2024 is going to be an amazing year if you want it to be. Or you can keep living 2023 and 2024. You know why? Because if, see, it, it's as dumb as this. Could you imagine buying a brand new house with a brand new refrigerator and taking moldy leftovers and putting them in the new refrigerator? I'm not the brightest guy in the world. Might not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but that's dumb. <laughs> Why? Because there's a moment that you have to be able to evaluate what's going on in your life and say, you know what? I've held on to this too long. I've allowed this to wreak havoc in my life too long. And it's going to weigh me down to the point that it's too heavy for me to progress forward into the things that God's called us to do. We can't have fixated faith and fixated trash. So what do we got to do? How's this smell to you? Get somebody in your life that's going to help you eat the leftovers or throw them out. Get somebody in your life that's going to hold you accountable in 2024 to be the best you that God's called you to be and to walk in the fullness of what he's called you to do. You need some help? There's pastors running around this building all over the place. Find one. Find somebody in a small group. Find somebody that you can go to lunch with and say, you know what, man? I've been dealing with this porn addiction my whole life, and I'm tired of it, and I want to get out of it this year. Will you help me? Not judge me. Help me. I'm tired of being angry and smacking my wife around and coming into that building on a Sunday morning and waving my hands and singing to the Lord when I'm cursing her all week long. I'm tired of carrying all of the injustices and everything that I've been through and everything people said I could or couldn't be or had to be because of the color of my skin or my gender or who, whatever else they might have said out of their own insecurities as you were growing up and they told you you would never amount to anything because they couldn't. Throw it out. Take out the trash. Watch what God does in 2024. You know, there's, there's something called the abundant life and there it is your question is how do i find the abundant life that god promises you know jesus started coming to give you life and life more abundantly well how do you do that how do you receive that how do you find that well it all starts in your heart it's where the abundant life always starts is with your heart you realize that there's nothing that you own that belongs to you God says, the gold is mine, the silver is mine, says the Lord. He says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. He owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. Everything that he does is about generosity. Heaven is about generosity. The world is about generosity. 
Forgiveness is about generosity. Grace, favor, blessing. I started thinking, I mean, my whole heart began to be flooded by all the things about who God is. And everything came back to one word, that he's a generous God. You've been created in the image of God, and every one of you have a generosity gene. It's already built into you. Yeah, come on. You know what God wants? He wants you to have an abundant life. But the problem is you think it's unscriptural, so you're afraid to ask for it, believe for it, expect it. Come on, am I right about that? So instead... You would rather just stay poor or without. Let me see your hands. How many of you want to stay poor all your life? How many of you want to do without all of your life? How many of you want to struggle all of your life? Let me see your hands. How many of you want to live a hopeless life without peace? Come on, let me see your hands. How many of you would like to see heavens closed up so that when you pray, nothing ever happens? Let me see your hands. How many of you want to live your life bankrupt and lose all you have and stay broke? How many of you want to be single? Raise your hands. Now listen, if you're married, don't raise your hands. <laughs> the reason why nobody's raising their hands this morning about what I'm asking is because God has put something on the inside of every one of you to believe for and expect to have an abundant life. And God is the God who wants you to live abundantly. He wants you to have everything that you need in this life. Can I hear an Amen. He wants to heal you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to touch you. He wants to guide you. He wants to lift you up. That's the kind of God we serve. That's called an abundant life. But Christians think it's unscriptural to want those kind of things. And so we don't believe that we should seek an abundant life. And so we're going to live in stress and in pressure and all these things. Can I just say, that is dumb. Didn't you say that was dumb? Okay, I'm going to say it. It's dumb to live that way. It's bad theology. That's not even in the Bible. Let me prove it to you. John 10, verse 10. You probably know the verse by heart. Jesus said, the devil comes, Satan comes, but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Do you see what God is saying, what Jesus is saying? It is his will that you have an abundant life. He wants you to have enough to live on, give on. He wants to bless you coming and going. But I want you to focus on the heart of Jesus, what he wants for you. He said, I want you to have an abundant life, more abundant. That means to have life to its fullest. You have everything beyond what you even can think. Now, look, I'm not just talking about money. Everybody thinks we're talking about money when we talk about abundance. I'm talking about peace. How many of you like to have a little peace in 2024? How about a little hope? Some of you need some hope. How about no stress? Wouldn't that be nice to walk through this life without stress? I'm going to tell you that a God of abundance wants to pour out upon you these kinds of things. It's not about just your money. It's not about just things. It's about everything else besides that. I want to live an abundant life. I don't know about you, but that's one of the focuses we ought to have as we move into 2024 is that God wants to bless me. God wants to heal me. God wants to touch me. God wants, wants me to, to have everything I need for my family and for my life. God is for me. God is not against me. I'm not walking alone. God is always with me. I'm not abandoned. I'm not lonely. I'm not an orphan. I have an abundant life because Jesus lives in me. The Holy Spirit, a part of the Godhead, lives on the inside of me. It's called the abundant life. But there's one thing that you've got to know. Let me give you a tip out of the Bible. Can I give you a tip? If you want to live the abundant life, here's the tip. Isaiah 1, 19. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Now, I know you're willing. How many of you want an abundant life? Can I see your hands? Okay, you're willing. But are you obedient? That's the part. We're all willing. We all want what God has, but are you willing to be obedient? Now listen, the first step that you've got to take to live an abundant life, to be obedient, is that you've got to develop a generous heart. A generous heart. I'm going to read to you out of Deuteronomy 15. You should supply him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine press. 
from what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. Now, God's command here is not just about giving. It's about generosity. It's not the attitude of giving. It's the attitude of generosity. It's being generous. Generous is where you do more than what is expected of you. And that you give more than respect. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about your talents and your skills and your ability. Some of you are so talented in this room and you just sit there and don't use it. You've got a voice like an angel. And people in front of you can hear that voice, but nobody else can. You've got, you've got a love for children, but you sit there and you don't use it. I'm going to tell you, we have things that God has given us. And he wants us to live an abundant life. You're willing but do you have a generous heart? That's the obedient side of it. I know at Christmas time, you probably gave a lot, didn't you? You bought presents, you wrapped them up, you did all those kind of things because of a generous heart. And was, it, was that a lot of joy to watch everybody open up those presents you gave them? I'm telling you, I had so much fun watching grandkids and my kids open up their presents. I mean, it just gave me such joy on the inside. You know the reason why? Because... I had developed a generous heart like you. But what about after Christmas? Christmas is over. 2024 is hours away. What about your generous heart for 2024? You know, Jeannie and I made a decision a long time ago. We want to we wanna be generous with our life. We want to give away what God's given us. Whether it be encouragement, whether it be a talent or skill or whatever it might be, even our money. I mean, that's fine. It doesn't belong to me anyway. God owns it all. When you die, you're not going to be pulling a U-Haul behind your hearse. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I'm going to share this with you. I, it was in the video just then, but I love talking about this. I'll talk about this to anybody that will listen to me. Because it was something that I discovered years and years ago that became a life lesson for me. One morning I was praying and I felt like the Spirit of the Lord said, can you describe me with one word? Now, if I were to ask you to describe God with one word, you'd do just like me. You would say, well, almighty. And I cried, almighty. And God said, no, that's not it. Omnipotent. And even though God's omnipotent, he said, that's not the word I'm looking for. I said, how about counselor? And, and, and I started going through all the kind of names to describe in one word, who God was, uh, uh, the great potentate. You know, I'm thinking of every kind of word I can think of. And after about 15 minutes, I just ran out of words and I just said, God, I don't know the word you're looking for. Because every time I would come up with a word in my spirit, it was like the Lord was saying, Nope, that's not it. That's not it. Nope, that was not it either. And all of a sudden, a word popped up into my spirit that changed my life. That described God with one word. It was the word generous. Generous. And I'm telling you, my mind began to be flooded with that word and what it meant. That God is a God of generosity. It's his heart to be generous. And if you and I want to live an abundant life, we have to have that same heart, a generous heart. Look, forgiveness is about generosity. Salvation is about generosity. Grace and mercy is about God's generosity. Am I right about this? Healing your body is about his generosity. Blessing you coming and going. Watching out over you. Protecting you is all about generosity. Heaven is about generosity. Preparing a mansion for you is about generosity. And I begin to think about all these things. And I'm telling you, I begin to realize that there's only one way to describe God to any person, whether they're a believer or not. He is a generous God. Generous in his love. Generous in his mercy. Generous in his kindness. In his gentleness. He has a generous heart. He lives in an atmosphere of generosity. And then I discovered one other thing on top of that that continued to just kind of expand in my spirit even to today when I'm talking to you about it. He said to me in a still small voice, he said, and by the way, that's how he said it to me, and by the way, you've been created in my image. 
You have a generosity gene on the inside of you. Every one of you sitting here right now, everyone that's listening to my voice or watching through the internet, you have a generosity gene. You were born with it because you've been made in the image of God. Just don't think God is generous. God has made you that way too. And if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. How many of you want to have an abundant life? I want one. I want to read another scripture to you before I close. It's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 9, verse 10. It says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply, I love this, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. That's called an abundant life. Now listen, God will supply and multiply seed sown. He doesn't multiply or supply necessarily beyond that from bread that you're supposed to eat. Now listen, if you're going to eat your seed, you'll never have multiplication. That's what the Bible says. If you eat the seed that's designed for sowing, you'll never have an abundant life because you've eaten up your multiplication. Are you getting this? This is a principle. And it's a principle we ought to take into 2024, like all these brothers right here have done, trying to share with you the six basic things. That's what we're doing. The six basic things we need to uh, usher 2024 in with our life. I know you want an abundant life, but do you have a generous heart? God has given you seed to sow, bread to eat. He will multiply, supply, and multiply seed sown. He will not multiply bread eaten. I'm telling you, God is a good God. The abundant life is what God has called us to. It's what he wants to bless you with. You know, it's not about an amount. It's about an attitude. And I'm praying that every person in this room, as we take one step into the new year, which is, as I said, hours away, that you would take these six things that we were sharing with you about prayer, about faith. You know, prayer without faith gets nothing. But prayer will move the hand of God if you believe you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and listen to his voice. He speaks to us. He leads you. He'll, he'll give you revelation. He'll show you the deep mysteries of God. But we got to throw out the trash sometimes, don't we? Get the stinky stuff out of our lives. Why would you want to carry that nasty stuff with you into 2024? Why don't you just go ahead and get rid of it this morning so that you can live an abundant life? Would you bow your heads for a moment? Father, I thank you that this morning, as we have just done our very best in these few moments, just to tag team, to share a few highlights of 2023, that we believe in our spirit need to be repeated. Because 2024 is upon us. And there are things that we need to bring with us into the new year. There are things we need to leave back and to forget about. But Lord, these are the six things I pray that each one of us would bring into this house. While your heads are bowed, how many of you need to improve your prayer life? You need to change that. Just slip your hand up. Say, I want to I make a change in 2024. How about your faith? Maybe it's been challenged in 2023, but this is the year you're going to say, listen, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be willing and obedient. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to believe what he said. Would you slip your hand up and say, I'm going to stretch my faith in 2024. Some of you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He can do that right now if you just ask. And if you will tune in your ear like you would tune in a radio station, the Spirit of the Lord will speak to you because He needs somebody that will listen to what He's saying. Would you listen? Just say to the Lord right now, slip up your hand and say, I'm going to listen to the Lord this year. I'm not going to listen to others. I'm not going to listen to the world. I'm not going to listen to the news. The news is not the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I'm going to throw out all my trash. 
I'm going to be like Paul the Apostle. I'm going to leave those things which are behind, and I'm going to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Come on, lift up your hand and say, I'm leaving my trash behind. Amen. And lastly, Lord, I want an abundant life. Help me to develop a generous heart, generous with my talent, generous with my time, generous with my treasures, generous with the skills and the abilities you've given me. Just lift up your hand and say, Lord, that's what I want to bring into 2024. I want to be generous. Help me to develop an attitude of generosity in Jesus' name. Now, before we, before we end the service, I have to ask one more thing. If you're not saved, you don't know Christ, or maybe you know him in your mind but not in your spirit, as I've said before, some people miss heaven by 18 inches because you got him up in your mind, but you don't have him down in your spirit, down in your heart. 2024 is going to be a terrible year for those that are not saved. And I'm just going to ask you right now, do you need to give your life to Christ? Slip your hand up. Let me pray for you. Nothing to be ashamed of or be embarrassed about. I did it when I was a young person. I just I raised my hand. I wanted to be saved. And you want in this house, you want to give your life to Christ. You want to make some things right that are not right. Amen. Father, I thank you for those who have responded. And they said, I want to make a change in 2024. I'm starting this year out brand new with you in my heart. Not the world. I've lived in the world. I don't want to live in the world anymore. Lord, I dedicate my life to you. I want you to heal me and deliver me. I want you to erase my sin and make me a new person. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said together, Amen. Won't you bring the house lights back up for just a moment? <clears throat> Amen. Listen, I told you last week I was going to make a, a kind of a special announcement. I've got some exciting news to share with you for 2024. How many of you want to hear some exciting news? Well, I'm not going to do it this week. I'm, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> you know, last year, Jeannie and I stepped back in. Jeannie, come on up here. This is my wife, Jeannie. We've been married, June will be 50 years. Amen. And uh, at the beginning of this year, we stepped back in. Actually, it was 2022 in December of last year. We stepped back into leadership to lead our church. And uh, with, great, with really great joy, we stepped back in to kind of guide us. And I'm going to tell you, God did some remarkable things in 2023. Don't you agree? I mean, we, in all of our lives, we have ups and downs, but I, I just see the ups all the time. We saw a lot of people saved in 2023, filled with the Holy Spirit. We saw lives touched, notable miracles, and, uh, and just some amazing things that took place in this year. But more importantly, we saw a deeper presence of God's Spirit in the house. How many of you sensed that since the beginning of this year? Amen. And so we're excited about the future of our church. And, uh, but here's, here's my announcement I want to make to you, is that on the 14th of January, a couple of weeks from now, Jeannie and I are going to move away from grabbing the steering wheel. We're going to slide on over from the driver's side to the passenger's side. And we're going to make a change and transition in our role as the senior leaders here in this house. Amen? Okay, don't act so excited now. I know that's what you've been waiting for. <laughs> but uh, when I stepped back in to uh, lead our church at the beginning of this year, the Lord gave Jeannie a word. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to her and said that he's going to do a quick work. Well, I mean, what does that mean, God's going to do a quick work? Well, in other words, my role to lead this church is not going to uh, last until I die. Now, I'll be 71 in a couple of months. And I don't think it's God's will for me to lead our church. We, we need young leadership in our, in our ministry here. Don't you agree? Amen. It's okay to clap. It's not going to offend me, I promise. We've been serving this church for 38 years. We founded this church. And we've been serving people in this house this whole time. We're not going to stop that because we love you. We love our church family. But, but uh, uh, the Sunday after I kind of stepped back in to take over, uh, a man came up to me and introduced himself, and uh, he said, you don't remember who I am? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, we had a phone conversation back in the summer of 2022. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know who you are. He had applied for our campus pastor in Longmont. I said, let's go have lunch the next day. 
So we had lunch, and while we were sitting having lunch, the Lord spoke to my heart. Now, this is only about a week or so after God had spoken to Jeannie about he's going to do a quick work. And, uh, and the Lord began to speak to me and said, this is the man that's going to step into this role. And so before we finish eating, I'm not this impulsive, but I did know his background. I said, I want to ask you to join our team as one of our pastors. And he said, yes. And we were pretty excited about that. So for all this year, he's been walking side by side with me. And really in the last three or four or five months, we've been pastoring the church together. Great preacher, anointed, powerful, lots of experience, all those kind of things. But we have been walking together. We've agreed on really everything. There's not really anything we've disagreed upon. Every major decision, every problem we've had to deal with. And it's almost like, I'm going to tell you what I told Jeannie. I said, it's like watching me when I was in my 30s and 40s. Same DNA, same principles, same values, same desire to preach the Word of God. I'm talking about unadulterated, preach the Word of God, authenticity, genuine, full of the Holy Spirit, skilled, talented, anointed. I mean, all those kind of things. And the Lord began to show me those kinds of types of things, and it was just bringing such peace into my spirit that God was sending the right person at some point in time that we would make a transition. And so over this year, the Lord's been confirming that to me, and, and I've watched how He's treated people, how He's talked to you. I've watched how He's preached. I've seen what He's done, how He's done it, and why He's done it. I've watched His wife. I watched how He speaks and treats His children. I've been watching these kind of things. I've been studying His life real closely, and I've listened to His words that He's spoken to me and to Miss Jeannie over this year. And just watching to see if those words are true or is it just words and i have found nothing but integrity and character and as i said authenticity and all of those things and i've heard him speak about vision and the future and and by the way i've sought counsel i don't do things without counsel and prayer with a lot of careful prayer and counsel we have presbyters overseers what we call them i'm an overseer of a lot of churches around america and, uh, and I've counseled them. They've met this man and his wife. And they have given us their full endorsement, 100% they're behind. Our board of trustees here in the house have also just so agreed as feel this is the will of God and the presence of God and what God wants to do. And so after a lot of prayer and a lot of, a lot of fear and trembling because we don't take this lightly because this is the house of God and we're responsible for it. But... Uh, with, with honor and such great respect, I've asked Pastor Jonathan Soprowski if he would step in in the role of the senior pastor of this church. Amen. Come on over here. Come on up here, Christy. Love you. <laughs> Now before, you can be seated. Now before I, I let him speak, let me just share a couple of things. Jenny and I are not leaving. We are not going anywhere. You can go ahead and be seated. We are not going anywhere. And I know people will ask that question, well, I guess you're going to be leaving. No, we're not going anywhere. We have been serving this house for 38 years. We're not going anywhere. I'm a pastor. I've been called a pastor. I will always be a pastor. I'm in ministry. I'm not going to, this is what I do. And we love you. We love this house. We love the heritage of our house. We love the DNA of this house. So we're not going anywhere. Now, I do preach from time to time in other churches around America and do conferences and so on. And so if I'm not sitting right there, you'll know where I'm at. Now, we do have our daughter and her husband moved to Montana back in the summer. So we're going to go up and see them every once in a while to go see grandkids. How many grandparents know what I'm talking about? That's an important thing. And so we're excited about having that opportunity to do that. But we're not going anywhere. Number two, I want to settle this right now. We are not retiring. I am not retiring. I have not. If I could figure out a way to make a living at it, I would do it. But the reality is that I told you I'm in ministry. I've been called to ministry. You're not called out of it. I'll be doing this until the Lord takes me home. And so uh, we're going to continue serving in this house. We're going to remain on the team and on the staff here. I'll be working behind the scenes a lot of projects, whatever Pastor Jonathan wants me to do. 
Uh, but Jeannie and I'll be reaching out to other uh, ministries and pastors. As I said, we pastor pastors. Jeannie has a heart for pastors' wives. And so we serve them as well as those that are in this house right here. And we're so excited about that. So that's our heart. And we're excited. You know, change is God's attempt to promote us. A lot of people don't like change. I kind of like change because I don't like it to be the same. I don't like California because it's always the same. 70 degrees all the time. I like a little winter. I like a little summer. I like a little spring. I like seasons, don't you? You know, that's what change is all about. This is a new season for Victory Church. And I'm so excited about it, and I am so, so honored and blessed to have this couple right here who I love dearly, and I can hardly wait to see what God is going to do in 2024 and the years ahead. Why don't you and, and Christy come on up here and share your heart? Well, happy New Year. We just want you to know we love you so much. You know, we, we have visited a few times before 2023. My mom attends this church, and so we had visited with her a few times and just walked out saying to each other, wow, that felt like home. And I just want you to know over the past year, this has become our home. And you have become our family. And thank you. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you for loving us and trusting us and sharing your hopes and dreams and hard times with us and only more of that in the future as we go forward together. And we are just so honored and so grateful to Pastor Mike and Ms. Jeannie for this opportunity as we go forward into 2024. And thank you. Amen. <clears throat> Well, I'm going to do my very best not to cry. I make no promises. It's my disclaimer. It is truly the honor of my life to pastor this church. And uh, come on. Amen. Just so grateful, so humbled at the opportunity to to accept what Pastor Mike and Ms. Jeannie have asked us to do and, and to walk forward into all of this. And before we go any step further, I, I want to honor you for your leadership, for the gifts, for the, for the presence that you carry, for the stability that you are, for the voice of wisdom, uh, and, and, and truly the most integrous people I've ever met in ministry. When they say it is, it is. When they say it's not, it's not. And that's, that's so important to me. You know, Kristen and I, we, uh, we've, we've just counted it as a privilege to be executive pastors this year. Work alongside the wares and, and learn the DNA of the house. Get a chance to learn the history of the house and, and be a part of what was going on here. And, 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 and most importantly, we, we fell in love with you. We love you. We really, really do. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's because there's something so special about Victory Church. And it's because we're a family. It's a family of believers, of people who want to run this race together and, and see God move and, and, and live this thing out that we hear every week on a Sunday. But Victory Church isn't a church that gathers on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Victory Church is a group of people that go out full of the Holy Ghost and live their lives as an example of who Jesus is and what he can do in us. That's Victory Church. You know, I, Kristen and I have prayed you know, all of our lives to be part of a church that, that, you know, matched who God made us and what he had called us to do in ministry and, and to be surrounded by people who passionately loved him the way we do, that, that wanted to worship the way we love to worship, not because it's about a show, but because we really want his presence. We, we, we wanted to be surrounded by people who were proud to call their church home, their church home, and were, weren't embarrassed to invite their family and their neighbors and their friends, but they wanted to invite them in to become a part of something greater than they are. And when we found victory, church we found home we prayed for you before we even knew you and as soon as we got the chance to meet you we knew this is it this is the place you know I, I I'm not Pastor Mike 
not as good looking as him. I can't tie a bow tie like him. I don't, I, I, and I'm not even going to try because he's him and I have to be who I am. But I can tell you this, I love that man. We're empowered by the same spirit. We walk in the same spirit. We serve the same Jesus. We want the same things. And so Victory Church isn't going to change. The DNA of this house isn't going to change. You know why? We didn't have to bend to fit a culture. We walked into something that we already came from. And because of that, we get to continue in the things that make Victory Church great. We're going to keep preaching the word, the whole word. We're going to keep worshiping. Why? Because we want to see the presence of God. We put these lights up here every Sunday, not so that you can be entertained, but so that we can use every gift that we have to worship him. We want to put on a show for Jesus. We're going to continue to develop and teach your children principles that are going to lead them and guide them through their entire life. And we're going to help equip you to keep doing that at home. Why? Because revival starts with the family. Revival starts at home. And guess what? When we're here or whether we're at our home, if there's no difference, revival is in us. It works through us. And we'll continue to be that kind of church from this day and forevermore you know something that pastor Mike always says to me he always says you know Jonathan the, we're the the church is the bride of Christ we're here to serve her and get her ready for the groom we want him to come back and find her prepared ready with anticipation for his arrival we're the bride and we're going to get ready. We're going to get ready together. But I got to tell you something. I, I have to tell you a secret, okay? This might shock some of you. The Soprowskis are not perfect. I know, right? Gasp. But the good news is neither are you. And so I can promise you this. While we may not be perfect, you'll always find us on our knees praying for you. You'll always find us rolling up our sleeves, getting ready to serve in this house with you. You'll always find us with great expectation, cheering you on to the great things that God's called you to do and helping you find the faith to live it and helping you find the determination to be who God's called you to be. We may not be perfect, but all we can ask is this. Think the best of us if you can. Give us the benefit of the doubt when you can, because every decision and every direction that we take in the future is going to be with you in mind and is going to be to honor the will and the heart of God in this house. Come on, Victory Church. Let's go, because we know where we came from. We know who we are, and we know that the best is yet to come. Come on, let's go. Well, what a great word from our pastor. And maybe God's touched your heart in some way or he's really speaking to you and you just want to talk to someone, reach out to us. Send us a message on social media. Send us an email. Give us a call at the church. We want to pray with you. We want to connect with you. We want to get you plugged into a small group. Just support you in any way that we can. And one thing we'd love to do is share testimonies and what God's doing in your life, what he's brought you from, what he's bringing you to, what he's brought you to, whatever it is. Let us know. Share it because it doesn't only encourage us, but it encourages our entire church family that, hey, if God's done that for them, imagine what they, God can do for me too. So let us know what he is doing in your life. We hope to see you this Sunday at 10 a.m. If you can't make it or even if you do and you just need to recatch the sermon, that's what this is for. Victory Church Online. We'll see you soon.